Welcome to day number 30, and we find ourselves in Galatians chapter 6. And in this chapter, Peter, we're kind of looking in the rearview mirror over the last five chapters. But in this um, chapter, Paul brings up the issue of freedom again, and he talks about how we're free in Christ. And Peter, when we think about freedom in our culture, and then look at what the Bible says about freedom, how do those sometimes not exactly map over each other real well? Let's talk about that. Well, back in um, chapter two, where Paul talks about the Jerusalem Council, you know, recall he um, describes these false brothers as people who have come in to spy on their freedom. So freedom is a real mark of the Christian for Paul. And so that's also come up in chapter five. And um, I think what Paul sees for freedom is oftentimes so different from what we see as freedom that we read it and we don't even know what he's talking about. So I don't know. I feel like sometimes in my own experience at the church, when people talk about freedom, they talk about um, never being held back by anything or like okay. never being bothered in right. their lives. Right. And in right. America, right. that's true. Yep. Yep. I'm free if I can basically do what I want or if I can, it can be demonstrated that I'm not being held back by anything. Okay. But it seems really important for Paul that freedom is for something. So he's gonna say in chapter five, don't let your freedom become an opportunity right. for the flesh. Yes. Freedom for Paul is a little bit like, it's, um, it's only good if you use it. It's kind of like... For the purposes of God, if you, almost. Freedom's yeah. like getting a preloaded credit card. If you don't spend it on anything, you basically don't have a preloaded credit card. Right, right. So the question's going to be, what are you going to spend it on? And what does he say they need to move towards yeah. in their freedom? What well, does he, he say? He says something that for us would be hmm. almost the opposite of freedom, but he says, bear one another's burdens. Interesting. Use your freedom to serve people. Um, so what kind of notion of freedom is that? Well, it must be a notion of freedom um, that isn't concerned about overcoming barriers or that isn't concerned about um, asserting and demonstrating its independence. It must be a sort of freedom where we are able to desire rightly and in the freedom of being able to desire what's good, we can go do what's good. Right. So um, being obedient to the spirit is freedom mm -hmm. for Paul. Sure. Because you're coming around to who you really are. Right. I had a professor in uh, grad school at the, the last place I went to grad school um, who uh, made this argument in which she said, you know, if God made you, then um, God is closer to you than you are to yourself. Hmm. Because God is the okay. only thing that sits between you and you not existing. Right. And that means that your true nature is God's will for your life. So you can actually become captive to yourself. Hmm. But the only true freedom is captivity to God. Okay. And so Paul, and this is kind of the big point I would like to make for the whole letter for me, that for Paul, um, the Christian life is about trusting the spirit and he names that as freedom. And so Paul can see this thing that I think is really hard for Americans to see sure. for this country that we have where we won a revolution um, that was all about Republican ideals. Every single person sure. can be free. Yeah. Well, yeah. Paul's vision of freedom and community, I don't think this is, um, what Paul is not talking about here is government, though it might apply in some ways to sure. governance. Yes. What Paul's talking about here is how do people live together? Right. His vision is you're free when you can desire what's good. And what's good for Paul is what Jesus was. And what Jesus was, mm -hmm. was giving of himself. And it, it again, I, I loved how you put it. It doesn't sound like freedom because Paul says, listen, now that you're free, used that freedom to bear one another's burdens. 
And people are going, but that's not what I'm looking for. I'm looking for me. But again, it would go back to what you were talking about yesterday, where the fruits of the spirits, uh, uh, Spirit allow us to live in community and kind of the fruits of the flesh destroy community. So everything for Paul is about how are we going to live together? What does this look like? And so he really encouraged us to do that. Now, for me, what really strikes me on this in this last chapter kind of helps to kind of capsulize everything that you find in his letter. And he says in verse number eight, he says, whoever sows to please their flesh from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the spirit from the spirit will reap eternal life. Verse nine, let us not become weary in doing good. For at the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. But I, I noticed this here, and Peter, I'm going to pitch you a question real quick. But I noticed here, he says, those that sow to the flesh reap dis destruction, and those who sow to the Spirit are going to reap eternal life. And then he has that beautiful sense of the idea of don't grow weary, keep doing what you know is right. And in the midst of that, I, we begin to discover this eternal life thing. So what do you think it means to sow to the Spirit? I think maybe sowing to the flesh, we might know what that is, right? Yeah. Where you go and you do things and you observe things and you fill your head with things, right? So what about sowing to the spirit? What do you think? Well, uh, maybe a good place to start on that question is what's eternal life? Well, for, okay. for us, um, it's, not, it's not terribly well translated. It could be maybe better translated this, the life of the age, the life of the times. And... Um, for us, eternal life means... You gotta die to get there. You gotta die to get there, yeah. and it goes on forever, <laughs> and that's the point. Yeah. But in Jesus' day, and in Paul's day, and in Paul's movement as a Pharisee, um, this belief had come about that God's, God's gotta fix the world. And when God fixes the world, God's gonna usher in this new age. Mm -hmm. And what it's like to live like, uh, to live life in that age where God is, where everything is going the way God wants it to go, where the world is running how it was created to run, when people are who they're supposed to be and sure. things do they're supposed to, that's the life of the age. And Paul here is using this phrase. So he's saying, if you reap, if you sow to the flesh, mm -hmm. you reap destruction. And on the one hand, it's not that it has nothing to do with an idea of a judgment after we die, sure. when God sets right, the right. world to That's right. That's well put, right. But Paul's mind was blown when he realized what was supposed to happen at the end of time, mm -hmm. which is God judging what's wrong with the world and resurrecting righteous people has happened in the middle of time in Jesus. Mm -hmm. And that's opened up the possibility where the future life of the age can happen in our lives here, sure. even though the world still isn't going the way it's totally supposed to go. So if you sow in the flesh, you reap destruction. That doesn't immediately mean going to hell. It immediately, mm. means, immediately means things like broken relationships. Yep. Things get torn down. That's Fraught really what relationships. that means. Yes. You know that moment, um, uh, there's a, um, a book I really like, but it admittedly has a lot of swear words in it, so I wouldn't really throw it around right. all the time, but this right. novelist who is a Christian says, um, what if you were in your 40s and you're in your bathtub this one afternoon and you look up at the ceiling as the water from the bathtub cruelly dances on the surface and you start to think about your life and you think about how nobody else made your decisions you made all the decisions, hmm. and you are absolutely not where you want to be. Wow. You have no one to blame. But yourself. And you're but yourself. Right. And your relationships are ruined, and you're, he says, isn't that the most terrifying moment? And in this book that he writes, he says, that's when you start realizing what sin is. Hmm. It's this human capacity to just ruin things. And hmm. in Paul's terms, it's actually the force that ruins things 
co-opting human capacity. Mm -hmm. Well, eternal life is when in this age, on this side of death, mm -hmm. we live in a community that is healing the world, that's putting it right the way God wants it put yes. right, that is um, sustaining and growing real relationships, yes. that is deepening in life with God and life with one another. And it just so happens that that continues after death. Mm -hmm. um, so sowing to the spirit is when we do the will of God by submitting to the desire of the spirit to bring about this community. And so I think Paul's going like, look, if you keep on that trail, mm -hmm. you will have the sort of community eventually, once all of these teachers get out of Galatia, <laughs> right, that can right. have, that can experience right. the life of the age. Right, right. Yeah. Well, let's conclude our time in prayer. What an exciting book we just came through. So let's pray together. Well, we pray the prayer Jesus taught us to pray our Father who is in heaven. Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And Lord Jesus, as we think about that prayer, we think about the ending of the book of Galatians that says that your kingdom comes through the spirit and in doing so, there's this community where earth now is made right as the will of heaven comes to earth. Lord, help each and every one of us who have watched this video to be a part of that movement. In Christ's name we pray, amen and amen. Well, God bless you, and we look forward to seeing you at tomorrow's video.